Tonight, I'll, of course, have it up on the screen, but if you'd like to turn there in your, in your Bible, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke, I will tell you, I do like to have it up on the screen, and I do print it on the bulletins, and it's, it's helpful, but there is something about looking in, in your Bible, too, and seeing it there, too, so I um, encourage you to get to Luke chapter 6, and again, we will have it up on the screen. This past Sunday, we looked at the power of a bad example. And we went to three different examples from the book of Acts, uh, dealing with Simon the magician, who thought that he could buy the things of God, and found out that, aren't you thankful, salvation can't be paid for by you and me, but only by his blood. And that he bestows his Holy Spirit and his gifts upon his children for his purposes and for his glory, and for the edification of the body of Christ. And then we looked at another bad example when we looked at Herod. Herod, who the people praised and said the voice of a God and not a man. And he didn't even say that to them. We don't get any words of what Herod actually spoke. It was such a wonderful speech, as I said on Sunday, that nobody knew the, word, <laughs> the words aren't recorded for us. But what we do know is that when they praised him as God, they flattered him. And he did not give glory to God, but he took that unto himself. That was enough of a sin. In fact, that's a very high-handed sin. We've sinned and fallen short of his glory. We need to give him glory. For every good and perfect gift comes from his almighty hand. And so here it is that he was struck by an angel of the Lord and died. Then we have the last example we looked at, Demetrius, who stirred up fears among the people. Fear about what was going to happen if the gospel spread in their city, which was dominated by the idol, the false goddess of Artemis or of Diana. And he was making uh, trade. He was part of a trade guild that would make novelties, if you will, souvenirs for the temple of Artemis and of Diana. And he stirred up fear among the people that if the gospels preach, people won't worship this false goddess and they'll go after the true and living God. And so they'd be out of business and their city would go down. And I said how it is this world likes to stoke fear. Even to the people of God, fear is a powerful motivator and we need fear only God Jesus said in Matthew 10 28 and I said most folks have more fear over finances than fear of their faith they have more fear with regard to country than regard to church and the matters of God how many know we need to uh, the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge a healthy respect for God and knowing that this God who as Matthew 10 28 says who could cast our soul to hell instead has sent his son that all who put trust in him might be saved and forgiven. And so we talked about these bad examples and things that we can learn from to not follow after their examples. How many like uh, to learn from the mistakes of others or sins of others if you can instead of your own mistakes and sins, right? Well, tonight we're going to have three powerful examples, but they're not bad examples. They're good examples and they are examples of worship, worship. And so we start in Luke chapter 7 tonight. And uh, here we are in verse 36, Luke 7, verse 36. Now, one of the Pharisees, and this Pharisee was named Simon, was requesting him, the him there is Jesus. One of the Pharisees was requesting Jesus to dine with him. And Jesus entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, 
She began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him, who invited Jesus, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Now we're going to skip to verse 48. But in the intervening passage there, Jesus, of course, he perceives that Simon, the Pharisee, is thinking this. Not only about Jesus, if he were a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman she is. Wouldn't have nothing to do with her. But he also perceives that he's judging that woman as well, is, is Simon. And so Jesus says, Simon, let me say something to you. And he tells him this. He says, there were two debtors. And one owed a certain amount of debt. And the other owed ten times as much. But this person that they owed the debt to forgave both of them. Who do you think loved him more? Simon says, well, the one who was forgiven more, the one who owed 10 times as much was more loving than the one that owed just the uh, one tenth of the other person's debt. Simon says, you said correctly. And then he says this. He says, this woman, that her sins were many and therefore she loved much. And then we come to verse 48. Then Jesus said to this woman, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. A very famous passage of scripture that uh, I've taken a full sermon to preach on before. This is only one third of the sermon tonight. And I promise I won't make it any longer than three hours. I promise Brother Kenny up front. He's giving me the thumbs up. Amen. Now, how many give me one hour? One, two, three, four. <laughs> Some of you were up to that. I know I've done that before. You remembered. But at any rate, here it is. This woman, this is a sinner woman. We don't know her name. She's a sinner woman. And that scripture says there was a woman in that town who was a sinner. How many know that description could go with any person living in that town? And this woman, she comes to Jesus. Now, here it is. Jesus was invited over to Simon the Pharisee's house for dinner. And Jesus went. Now, if you're familiar with the New Testament, you know that Jesus and the Pharisees, they mostly didn't get along. The Pharisees hated Jesus. Jesus did not hate the Pharisees, but he was sure tough on them. And why was he tough on them? Because he loved them. And Jesus was going to speak the truth. And when Jesus spoke the truth, even though it sounded harsh, when Jesus spoke the truth, that was loving. I had a student today that I was speaking the truth to. And on the way to lunch, I was speaking the truth to him. And you know what? This seldom happens. But I was on the way and I said, have your parents ever had a talk like this with you? Correcting your misbehavior and that you're getting ready to go into high school. And so you need to think about, you know, some of these things he was doing. He says, yes. I said, you ought to be thankful for them. He says, I am. And thank you too, Mr. Strunk, for taking that. I said, wow, he said that. I, whether he meant it or whether he did that with his parents and had good results, I don't know. But... How many know, even when Jesus seems harsh, he's telling the truth. And he's not saying it with the purpose of con condemnation. But if you're not convicted with your sin, how will you ever turn to the Savior? Sometimes we talk about people and we offer for them to be saved. But they don't even know what they're to be saved from. Because they're not familiar with what the law of God says. And if it is that you don't realize you've broken the law, someone could come and, come and say, well, you're saved from this. You're saved. And saved from what? Saved from the wrath of God that should justly come upon sinners. But Jesus took it for those who put their trust in him. But here it is, is that what transpires is, is that Jesus goes to the Pharisee's house. It shows that he cared for even them. He went to that dinner. And he goes over there to the Pharisee's house. And women were not invited to such uh, uh, occasions at all. And certainly not a sinner woman like this woman. In fact, the if you read this scripture, do some study, the woman's particular sin was not mentioned but she was probably a, a lady of the night is probably her sin is what most tend to think but she's a sinner woman many sins jesus said her sins are what forgiven. many her sins are many but and then he would say they're forgiven but he says her sins are many her sins are many and so here it is this woman she comes because even though women weren't invited when you would have this big dinner in this banquet hall it was kind of like a public kind of sitting and people could hear what was going on around and this woman what does she do she's not invited but she comes there to jesus and notice does she even say a word not one word 
that we have recorded in scripture. And here it is, is that she comes to Jesus and what does she do? But she takes this vial of perfume and she starts to wash Jesus' feet with her tears, with her hair. She is there at Jesus' feet. I told you the title of this message is three examples of worship. And it's all three of these examples we're going to look at are, it just happens to be as women. But these are people that were worshiping at the feet of Jesus. We say the, I, we say the concept, you may learn at the feet of somebody. And we don't literally mean that you're at their feet. We mean that you're, you're there and you're learning from them. But these people were literally at Jesus' feet. Now Jesus, fully God to be sure, but also in his incarnation, fully man. And he's walking dusty roads. And he's walking where it is that the sun would crack your feet and would the rough terrain. And your feet could be cracked and your feet could be very dirty. In fact, it was customary that when you went to a person's house, like Jesus went to Simon's house for this dinner, that the host, to be hospitable, part of what he would offer is to wash your feet. Either themselves or a servant of theirs, someone who worked for them, would wash your feet because your feet back then would get very nasty in the, in the, the terrain that's there, the sand and what have you. Well, Simon didn't offer this courtesy to Jesus. He didn't wash Jesus' feet. But this woman comes, what does she do? Here are the feet, surely the feet of God, but also the feet of someone who's fully man. And she is there at his feet. And she's washing them with her hair and with his perfume and with her tears. How many know that's an act of great humility? When we talk about worship, in fact, the root word of worship is something that is worthy Something that has a standing of being worthy. And worship itself literally means to fall on your face in front of. And is that not what this woman is doing? She is on her face there at Jesus' feet. And she is worshiping. She didn't ask for a thing from him. She didn't ask one thing from Jesus. Not one thing did she ask. But she knew who he was. Or at least she had a better idea of who he was than Simon did to be sure. And she is there and she is worshiping him. Not with her words, but certainly with her heart. With all that she is as she's there worshiping the Lord. You know, there's some folks that will, will only worship the Lord when they wanted to do something. Or when they needed to do something. Then when I'm doing okay, well, then I don't need to worship the Lord or be about the things of God. This woman was not that. She worshiped Jesus, not for what she could get from him, but for who he was my sweet wife. She sings a song uh, from time to time. Says, I worship you because of who you are. And how many know it's good to know who God is? You'll hear in prayer many times. I like to mention the attributes of God because scripture teaches us the attributes of God. That he is faithful. We sang that tonight, didn't we? Great is your faithfulness. Morning by morning, new what? Mercy. He's merciful. He is kind. He is good. He is holy. He is righteous. He is eternal. He's all knowing. All these, he's everywhere, all at once. How many are thankful for these attributes of God, for who he is? And as we praise him, as we worship him, as we study scriptures to know who he is, this woman, she is showing that Jesus is worthy to be worshipped, even though she hadn't asked anything of him, certainly not with her words, but because of who he is. And because he's the king. And she's broken the role of the king. She's broken the law of the king. She's broken it time and time again. And in strong ways. And I've got news for us. All of us have. And when we come before the king. It ought to be with worship. One of surrender. One of laying down any thought of our own worthiness. One of laying down any thought that we, even who are people of God, have earned our salvation because we certainly have not. If you're saved, it's because of His work upon the cross. Not of works that we've done or stayed away from. And here it is, is that He's the one who's worthy. And what is she doing? She is there at His feet. And then what is it while she is there recognizing He's the King? recognizing that she is in worshiping him for who he is. What does he say to her? By the way, in that little parable that Jesus told that I've mentioned to you that we didn't read. If I, if I know about this microphone, I'd put it all in there and went longer than I <laughs> But here it is, is that what happens is that Jesus said those two debtors, remember the two debtors illustration that he used with Simon? 
One owed a tenth of the amount of the other. The other owed ten times as much. And he forgave them both. But there's a line in there that Simon didn't get, or at least he didn't get right then. Here's what Jesus said. There was one that owed him a tenth of a debt, one owed him ten times as much, and neither were able to pay. Even the one that owed a little, seemingly so, in the eyes of man anyway, couldn't pay. The one who owed a lot couldn't pay. Anybody ever, you know, been in a time in your life and you got a bill, it wouldn't have mattered if it was five hundred or five thousand dollars. You ain't got five hundred, you ain't got five thousand, right? And you get in the bill and it is that you may not have it. Well, can I tell you, spiritually before God, you, me, nobody has the goods to pay for their own sin. Only Jesus can pay for that sin. None of us can pay. There might be people in the world that would say, well, he's been, he's been ten times better than this one. Or vice versa. I'll make it vice versa. I'll look out for you, Brother Kenny. He's, he's been ten times as bad as this one. All right? You might say that sort of thing. And you might think that in the world. But all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. Neither could pay. But both were forgiven. And how many are thankful. Though your sins be as scarlet, he'll wash them lighter than snow. As we sing so often in the old Fanny Crosby song. The vilest of sinners. Who truly believes that moment from Jesus. A pardon receives. How many are thankful for that? And here it is, is that this woman, she couldn't pay for her sins and neither could Simon. The only hope they had is Jesus who was there. And what does Jesus say to this woman who's worshiping him for who he is? Recognizing who he is, he's worthy. Recognizing who she is, she's not. What does Jesus do? He says, woman, you're saved by faith. Your sins are what? And all the people, what do they do? There's several times where Jesus would say, your sins are forgiven. And the people that heard it, they had the right question. Who is this who forgives sins? And you can I tell you, if Jesus isn't God in the flesh, he's out of turn. He's out of order. Why? Because I can't forgive you your sins and you can't forgive me my sins. Oh, maybe you did me wrong and I can say I forgive you in the sense of I forgive you for the wrong that you have done for me. But every sin is ultimately and first and foremost against God. Psalm 51, against you and you only have I sinned, said David, even though certainly it's sinned against others. But God is first and foremost. We've broken his laws. We've broken his commands. And here it is, is that we have sinned against God. Only God can forgive sins. And how many are thankful Jesus is God in the flesh. And what did he say to this woman worshiping him at his feet for who he is? She didn't even say a word. He says, your sins are what? Can you imagine that woman leaving that banquet that day? She didn't eat any food, best we know. She wasn't invited to the dinner. She didn't have a plate set before. But how many know she left the fullest of anybody that day? Her sins were forgiven. No greater thing could be done than for your sins to be forgiven. Remember when the paralytic was let down through the roof as Jesus is preaching? What does Jesus do? He says, your sins are forgiven. Who is this? Before he even heals the man physically, he says, your sins are forgiven. Can I tell you? They were saying, who can forgive sins? And of course, Jesus says, so that you may know that the Son of Man, speaking of himself, has the authority to forgive sins. He healed the man too, physically in his body. But can I tell you, the greater blessing that they got was that body, that body, even though it was lame and now it wasn't lame anymore, that body died. That body died. No matter what health he died in, he died, dead and buried, long 2,000 years ago, give or take, a few uh, a moment in time. But that body is dead. That was only temporary as far as in the physical, but your sins forgiven, that's eternal. And you have a glorified body. How many are thankful for that? Amen. Your sins are forgiven. So here's this woman. She worshiped Jesus and a great example to us of worship for who he is. And I will say just this before you, we go on. We do well to worship God for who he is. Think about his attributes. Like we sing even in the relatively new song. Here I am to worship. You're altogether lovely. Altogether worthy. Altogether wonderful. What? The attributes of God. King of all days. Who is he? He's king. Yet he humbled himself. Humble as well. The humble king. How many know we do well to worship God for who he is? Amen. Here's next tonight. We're going to go to another gospel passage. John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. John chapter 12. And we're going to read again another familiar passage with uh, some familiar uh, 
folks here. And beginning in verse 1 it says this. Jesus therefore six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there and Martha was serving but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii? That, by the way, that's a year's worth of wages. A denarii is one day's worth of wages, and it's a, it's a, a, a good wage. Okay, A denarii is one day wages. And, of course, there were days that one didn't work throughout the year. So 300 denarii, that means a year's salary. And given to poor people, verse 6. Now Judas said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Therefore Jesus said, let her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Now, you're familiar with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, right? They show up in scripture a few times. The first time is Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, uh, the end of that chapter... What happens is that Jesus goes to Bethany, to the house there, and this is where we get verse 38 and following, if memory serves, Luke 10, the end of the chapter. And what happens here is this, is that Jesus is at the house. There are two sisters, Mary and Martha, and their brother Lazarus. They live in a town called Bethany. And while they are there, uh, Martha is busy serving the dinner. And where is Mary? She is at the feet of Jesus. Why is it happens? I've seen this many times in my mind's eye. Is that uh, you ever been waiting at a counter and it doesn't seem like anybody's coming and you, you don't really want to say anything so you'll rattle your keys. Anybody? <laughs> or you'll tap on the counter hoping that they'll notice, right? And uh, hoping that they'll come and you don't have to say anything. They're like, oh yeah, there you are. Well, I, I, I don't know that that happened, but most people, they try to lead up to something before they actually say something. So Mary, Martha sees Mary there at the feet of Jesus and not helping her do the serving and says, Lord, don't you care? Finally, she can't handle it anymore. And she says, Lord, don't you care? Tell her to get up and help me because I'm doing all this serving. She's there at your feet. And what does Jesus say to her? Martha, Martha, you're concerned about many things, but only one thing is needful. Mary's chosen the good part and it will not be taken from her. How many like the idea of something that can't be taken? She's chosen the good part. That can't be taken from her. Then we come to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And again, I, there's not supposed to be any math at night. But John chapter 11 comes right before John chapter 12. <laughs> where we were at. And in John chapter 11, you remember that story. You might not remember the address, but you'll know the scenario. In John chapter 11 is where Jesus is told that Jesus is not in Bethany at the time. He's a couple days journey away. And he's told that Lazarus is sick. And we don't know what kind of sickness he had, but we do know that it must have been pretty powerful because it went from him being sick to being four dead, days dead by the time Jesus gets there. So it must have been a pretty powerful uh, uh, malady that he had. Jesus, uh, there's this whole story in, in Jesus delaying, but eventually Jesus does go back to Bethany, to the hometown. And you know how the story goes. Jesus goes there and who's first to meet him of the sisters but Martha. Martha comes and Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And he says, well, uh, he'll, he will rise again. Do you believe this? She says, yes, I know he'll rise again if he, it, you know, at the last day. I know that. And Jesus said, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. The second sister, because that's Martha, Mary comes. And you know what Mary does? She has a short conversation there with the Lord. But it would say that he, she fell at his Anytime you see Mary, this is not Mary Magdalene, this is Mary, the sister of Martha. Anytime you see her, what does she do? She, she's at Jesus' feet. Is there a better place to be? And here it is, she's there, she's at Jesus' feet. And what does Jesus do? Jesus comes and he goes there and he weeps because he sees not only the one whom he loved is dead, but he sees, because see, death came into humanity because of sin. I will tell you, there is no explanation death, which is presented in Scripture as an enemy. The last enemy, the enemy that Christ has conquered. And I tell you, all of us will be conquered by death if it weren't for Christ having risen from the dead. 
Because we could never conquer death. Not on our own. We never could conquer death. Only Christ could conquer death. And then we are made more than conquerors, not in our own power, but through His resurrection power. And so here it is. is that what does Jesus do? He weeps. He sees what has transpired. Not only to Lazarus, but to the race of humanity. And what does He do? But He says, Lazarus, come forth. And what does He do? He comes forth. Lazarus comes forth and he's bound hand and foot and they loose him and they let him go. And in John chapter 12, just in the same week that Jesus is getting ready to be crucified, not meant much time past this scenario. After Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, Jesus goes back to their house and he goes there to have dinner. And Martha is serving and Mary goes at the feet of Jesus again. And she has this costly perfume worth a year's wages, that she is there just lavishing it upon the Savior. And she's there at the feet of Jesus. She's worshiping Him, not only for who He is, but for what He has done. He raised her brother from the dead. And what, even more importantly, he, she knows that one day those who are believers in Him will be raised from the dead and a life eternal with glorified bodies. She has an inkling of this. They confessed it back in John chapter 11. She is worshiping him for what he has done. Now, with the first scenario with the woman in Luke 7, which was a different, I know a lot of it was similar as far as the, the washing the feet with the, with the hair and what have you. But these are two different women, two different settings, but two different women that were both at the feet of Jesus. I mentioned with the woman in Luke 7, she's worshiping Jesus for who he is. She didn't, hadn't asked for a thing. And that it's important to worship him for who he is. And I mentioned that some people only worship him when they want him to do something or need him to do something. But can I tell you, there's some people that they worship him when they need him to do something or want him to do something. But then after he does it, they don't worship him. You say you got scriptural proof for that? Absolutely. Remember the ten lepers? He healed all ten. How many came back to give thanks? One. Dottie Rambo wrote a song. I know you're used to hearing me say Bill Gaither wrote a song. Dottie Rambo wrote a song. Sister, our dear sister Sharon. She used to sing so many Dottie Rambo songs in she says you're singing. I tell you, I love to listen to those songs of her singing that. But she had, Dottie Rambo wrote a song, and, and uh, one of the songs, many that she wrote, over 2,000. And she wrote a song that says, I just came to talk with you, Lord. And here's what it is. She says this. She says, I, 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 so many times, Lord, has trouble brought me to my knees, but I just came to talk with you, Lord. Just came to worship you, to praise you. She says, I have no selfish motive in mind. Just want to thank you for all the other times. I just came to talk. And I like those particular words because of this. We can overlook the Lord's blessing so easily and not give him thanks and worship for it. So many things that God does and we don't we don't give Him thanks and we don't give Him praise for what He does. So many times we will notice what He does, but not stop to give Him thanks for it. And that's even worse. It's one thing not to notice and not give Him praise. That's bad. Or worship. That's bad enough. But it's even worse when we actually know what something we're praying for. And here it is. God has done the blessing. I cannot tell you over the course of life. And I don't say this judgmentally toward anyone that will come across my mind. Because Lord knows we've all done similar things. But I know of folks that you will stand and pray with and pray for such a thing that's heavy upon their heart or heavy upon their mind. And then that thing maybe even happens through the mercy and the grace of God. And then not many days, months, or years from that. And that person doesn't even acknowledge God hardly at all. Anybody ever had that happen with somebody? I tell you, how many don't want that to be you? Doesn't want that to be me. But we want to worship Him for what He's done. For what we know that He's done. And look for the many things that He's done. Can I tell you? You say, well, what has He done? Any good thing that you or I have ever enjoyed. Truth be told, as I've mentioned many times, even that unbelievers enjoy is only because of God's graciousness. And in fact, the unbeliever that doesn't worship God or give Him thanks, the very fact they receive these blessings from God, if they don't repent, put trust in Christ and give Him glory will add to their condemnation on judgment. But I will tell you, those that don't give Him glory in this life, those who are even unbelievers, one day they'll give Him glory. You look at your bulletin. If you got one on Sunday or you got one back there and it says this from Philippians 2, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow 
and every tongue confess that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. How many know this is a wonderful example? Martha, uh, Mary didn't just receive a goodness from God, didn't just receive a, a, a miracle certainly from God, but she also wanted to worship God for what He had done and for who He is. How many want to worship God for who He is and for what He's done? You want to know what God, who God is, read the scripture. It'll tell you those attributes we mentioned before and so many others. You want to know what God has done? Well, search your own life, certainly for any good thing. But search in scripture. Who forgives all your sins. Who redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desire with good things. Who one day is calling coming again to call you unto himself that where he is, there you may also be. Who gives you peace in this life. Who causes you to triumph. Who gives you of his spirit. Who gives you of his word. How many know he's done a lot? More than we can ever recognize this side of the Lord. And we do well to worship him. There are many. You, you see there, there's another person involved in this passage, which I won't mention many times, but I will tell you. Judas. Judas is involved here, right? I would tell you, Judas only has a very few words to say in Scripture. The first words he ever says is from John chapter 12, where he says what we just read. He sees this, he says, and notice he was intending already to betray Jesus. The verse says that. And what does he do? He says, why was this? Why was this taken and, and, and used in this way when it could be for the poor? Now, Jesus, you read throughout the word, God has... A heart for the poor. We need to be a blessing for sure. Jesus isn't saying to discard the poor here. But Judas had no fault for the poor. He just he wanted to pilfer something for himself. Judas. Judah. The very name means praise. And how many know he wasn't the one praising the worship of God here. Mary was. You know what the last words recorded to Judas are? Where it was after he betrayed Jesus and he saw Jesus crucified, he comes to the leaders that he had sold Jesus out to. And he returns the pieces of silver, the price for a slave. And he returns those back to them and he says, he says, he said to them, I have betrayed innocent blood. And then he went out and hung himself. Okay, here it is. That man didn't repent and put trust in Christ and he did not give God glory in this life. But I will tell you this, is that Mary did, and today, 2,000 years later, there's a lot of kids named Mary. Nobody names their son Judas. <laughs> How many want to follow after the example of Mary and not that of Judas? Here it is next. The last passage we're going to go to also comes just from John. John chapter 20, verses 11 and 18. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. So as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white setting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. Now, most of you are familiar with this passage. John chapter 20, Jesus has been crucified. He's risen from the dead. Mary Magdalene came there early on the first day of the week, on Sunday morning. She came there in order to uh, uh, honor uh, who she thought would be a dead Jesus. And you've heard me say this many times, because this passage is... Just one of my favorite. She comes there to honor a dead Jesus. How many know there's some folks that may claim to be people of God and don't give as much honor to a Jesus that we know is alive. <laughs> but she didn't know he was alive. She thought he was dead. She came there to honor a dead Jesus. What does she do? But she finds that the stone is rolled away and she finds that the body isn't there. She goes and tells Peter and John they check it out too and his body isn't there. Mary comes back to the tomb now. She comes back to the tomb. And what does she find? She's weeping uncontrollably. It's a very strong word there for weeping. It's not just a little cry. It's like a big cry. Okay? And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. She saw two angels in white setting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. I will tell you, if you go back to the book of Exodus, the Ark of the Covenant, you had two cherubim. We sometimes say cherubim, but in the Hebrews, cherubim. Cherubim are there. Two angels and the mercy seats in between. And here it is. Many scholars, and I think rightly so, look to this say, Jesus' body, where his body had been laying in that tomb. Now, his body isn't there anymore. He's risen from the dead. But where his body had been laying, there's an angel at the head. There's an angel at the feet. 
And thanks be to God, there's a mercy seat where the blood of the Son was shed, whereby you and I may come into the presence of God through that precious blood. How many thankful for that? And so here it is, that she sees the angels. And the angel said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid yet. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, did not know that it was Jesus. Now, why she didn't know that it was Jesus is up for speculation. Maybe it's because the word used there again for her weeping, she's weeping uncontrollably. How many of you ever wept uncontrollably? Everything in your eyes is just all foggy. Right? She might not. But it could have been simply supernatural. The disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, they didn't know who Jesus was. It wasn't because tears were filling their eyes. It's because supernaturally they were kept from recognizing him for a period of time. So why it was she didn't know it was him, I don't know. Could have been the tears could be just seeming supernaturally. She's kept from recognizing him. But she doesn't know it when she sees him. In fact, she thinks it's the gardener. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? By the way, whom are you seeking? You remember when the guards came for Jesus? And he gave them that same line. Who are you seeking? And you know what happened to them? Power of God. And they were down on their faces. Remember, worship means down on your face. Here he says, whom are you seeking? What does she say to him? Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him. Oh, what love. Here she is. She's. Uh, now, 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 don't get me wrong. I know some of you women are very strong. Some stronger than I am. I'm not. I, I, I have a lot of weight of my own to move around, but I can't lift a whole lot of weight. But I would tell you, uh, uh, for a woman to say that she's going to go get the body, going to somehow find a way to carry that body herself. I mean, let's love. She, she, she's love. She wants to go and get that body. You, you just tell me where you're taking him. I'll go. I'll take care of the rest. I tell you when I see that, that's just, that's love. So I'm going to go there. I'll get the body. Verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni. Now, I didn't just elevate my voice there for a preaching technique. It's because I'm reading it correctly. It doesn't say Mary, period. It says Mary, exclamation point. It just doesn't say Rabboni. It's Rabboni with an exclamation point. When Jesus said her name, Mary, she didn't recognize him by, by looks. Some scholars will say, too, that part of the reason she might not recognize because the last time she had saw him, the last time she had seen Jesus, while the disciples, for the most part, except John, ran away, she was there toward the foot of the cross as he's being crucified. And Isaiah says his visage was marred beyond that of any man. The last time she had seen him, she couldn't even have. Well, I mean, she knew that that was him, of course, because they had followed him. But he was almost beaten to the point of, of, of unrecognizable. And now she sees him, and he doesn't look that way anymore. Now, he's still got the prince, nail prints in his hands and in his feet. But he looks a lot different than he had the last time she had seen him. But she didn't recognize him by sight. But when it was that, she, that he called her name, Mary, she knew who it was then. How many are thankful if you're saved, the Lord called your name? And can I tell you what did Jesus say in John chapter 10? My sheep hear my voice. And they know me and they follow me. And I give unto them everlasting life. And the voice of another they will not follow. She recognized the voice of her shepherd. He said, Mary. And what did she say? She says, Rabboni. Now, most of you have probably read that passage many times. And you've seen the word Rabboni there. Okay. Now, where are you saying the word rabbi, right? Rabbi, teacher. In fact, we even use that for uh, the Jewish synagogues, the teacher today. We call the rabbis so-and-so or such-and-such, whatever the name is. Okay? Instead of pastor, it's, they will say rabbi. Well, can I tell you, if you go to Jewish tradition, you'll find that there were three words they could use for a teacher. Rab, rabbi, and rabboni. And rabboni is like the highest one. And she says, rabboni. She recognizes who it is. She turned and said to him, teacher, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I am not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And then he had said these things to her. Now, you remember Luke chapter 7. Where was that woman worshiping at? 
at Jesus' feet for who he was. Remember John chapter 12, Mary, a different Mary than this one. Mary's sister Martha is at Jesus' what? Feet. Praising, worshiping him, certainly for who he was, but also for what he had done. And when we come here, this Mary Magdalene, now you may look read this scripture and say, it doesn't say that she was at his feet. Now everybody would agree she's worshiping him because he's alive. But I would tell you, if you read Matthew chapter 28, verse 9, Matthew 28, 9, it talks about the women who were there, which Mary Magdalene was one. It says that they were at his feet. She's clinging to him. And he says, don't, don't stop clinging to me. I'm not going to send it to the Father. And uh, she, then she goes and she said, uh, or, uh, I have seen the Lord and that he has said these things to her. She goes announcing that. She is worshiping him. And why is she worshiping him? So many reasons, but I'll give you at least two. She's worshiping him because Mary Magdalene, if you're familiar, she had been one who Jesus had cast seven devils out of her. Can you imagine having devils, seven of them, the devil inside of her? She had seven of the, I tell you, now, don't get me wrong, there are some that talk about spiritual warfare and they see devils behind every bush and uh, they even, I, I tell you, when I worked at the bookstore, I would see these books. I'm like, there ain't no scripture for any of this that these people are saying. None. Okay, they want to know names and territorial this, that, and the other thing. And I'm, I, I don't exactly, they've made up more than what I find in scripture. But I will tell you this. Even though we seem to tend to think of ourselves in modern society as refined, there are devil's loose. How can something happen like it did yesterday and there not be a devil loose? In Texas. How can things happen? And there's not a devil. There is a devil. And there are devils in this world. And how many know there are? So many things will say this, that, or the other thing. And I'm not saying everything is attributable to the devil. But I will tell you this. The devil is alive and at work. And it, like I said, just watch the news for about three seconds on any given day. And you'll know there's a devil loose. But I will tell you this, aren't you thankful? There is one, Jesus said he cast out devils by his very finger. Finger. Not fingers, finger. I mentioned it before, but you go to the Old Testament and it'll say that when God, uh, uh, in Psalm 8, when God made the world, it was by his fingers. When he delivered his people out of Egyptian bondage, it was by his hand. When he casts out a devil, or devils, it's by the finger. But in Isaiah 53, and I mentioned this this past Resurrection Sunday when we ministered there for some period of time. He, when he saved humanity, he stretched out his arm. <laughs> to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Aren't you thankful he's got a strong arm? And here it is. She had seven devils cast out of her. The devils, why they were in, the devils don't give genuine worship to God. And when the devils are in a person, they don't give genuine worship to God. But aren't you thankful that when one is in Christ and those devils are cast out and the Holy Spirit comes instead of the evil spirits, aren't you thankful that the worship that once was hindered by the devil, now the worship should come from the child of God and the King of Kings. And what does this woman do? She had been delivered from the devil and she never forgot. And she worshipped him. She had been delivered from And now why else does she worship him? Because he's not dead. He's alive. She was willing to go and honor him even thinking he was dead. But now, wonderful news. He is alive. And in the words of the song, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive, and I'm forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. He said that he would die. He said that he would rise. She had seen him die, but now she sees him alive. His word is true. And he's worthy of worship. Why? Because the devils are calling. Because he has been raised. What can the devil hold over the child of God in the scope of eternity? When it is that we have been bought with a price and are now filled with his spirit. Doesn't mean that devils won't influence or come against a believer. For surely the devil throws his fiery darts. But aren't you thankful that if the Holy Spirit's on the inside, aren't you thankful... The devils don't, uh, uh, what's the word, possess and have control. That they may influence and they may tempt since they even try to tempt our Lord. Aren't you thankful that there's victory in Jesus? 
And aren't you thankful that there's victory over the enemy of death? Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Why? Because Christ has risen. And because he has risen, so too we will rise who are in Christ. And that's worth worshiping Jesus about. Can I tell you, go to praise the Lord. You go to worship the Lord. And I mentioned before we sang tonight a relatively new song. I, I say it's a new song. The praise course has been around for a while. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord Almighty, holy, holy. And we sing that five times at the end. I'm going to tell you, I'll just be honest with you. Sometimes there's some songs that uh, you just repeat the same thing over and over again. And it's like, uh, you're, you're just ready for a verse to come. I'll be honest, if I've never been there before, you're just ready. Yeah, give, me a, give me another verse. The hymns tend to add one upon another. Uh, but you're ready. But I will tell you, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Can I tell you, that is sung over and over and over and over again. I like to think of it. And I've mentioned it many times. Isaiah saw it 750 B.C. John the Revelator sees it about 180, 800 to 850 years in between. And in heaven, they're still saying, holy, holy, holy. He is the Lord God Almighty, Father, Son, and Spirit, trying to holy, holy, holy is the thrice holy God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty who was and is and is to come. 850 years singing the same thing and never tiring. Why? Because God is holy, 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 holy. And I tell you, we do well to worship God for who he is, his attributes given to us in Scripture. We do well to worship God for what he's done. Search scripture for what he's done. And look over your own life. Anything good has come from his almighty hand. Worship him. Why? Because as well, if you're a child of God, thanks be to the Lord. Even though, uh, though the world with devils filled with threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. How many are thankful? There is victory over the devil. Victory over death. Victory over hell. Victory over the grave. Because he is risen. And that's worthy of giving him worship. Forever and ever. At the feet of Jesus. Let's stand to the Lord tonight. Lord we come before you tonight. If there be any here tonight. That has not repented of sin. And put trust in Christ. That have not availed themselves by faith. Through that promise. Of which the woman received. To hear those words from Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. Those words are written down in scripture that those who would repent of sin and put trust in Christ be saved and forgiven. Their sins as far as the east is from the west to be remembered against them, held against their account no more. Because Jesus paid it that our record might be expunged. If there's any here tonight that's not a child of God, I pray they come with something like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. You, Jesus, are the only Savior. Make me your child. And Lord, for those who are your children tonight, while there are recent days or while there are many years, even decades of our life, indeed, the words of another old song, the longer we serve you, the sweeter you grow. And Lord, as we come before you tonight, those who know you, I pray tonight that we would worship you for who you are and we'd seek your word for those attributes. We would worship you, that is, be not only in perhaps physical position, but more importantly, a spiritual position of just recognizing that we are not worthy, but you are worthy. What we were worthy of was a sin and of death and of hell because we had sinned against the holy God. But you, the worthy one, sent your son to die that we might be forgiven. And we pray that we would praise you, worship you, for you are the one who is worthy. We pray we would worship you as well for all that you've done in Scripture, for your salvation, for the promises you give us in Scripture. And as we look over our own lives on a day-to-day -day basis, as we look over the months and over the years and over the decades, and we say, God, anything good has come from your almighty hand. And may we worship you for that. And Lord, I pray that we would worship you knowing these spiritual truths as did Mary Magdalene. That if we are in Christ... We are a new creation. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. We are now infilled by the Spirit of God. And indeed, Christ is risen from the dead. 
And we should worship you with all that we have and for all and with all that we are for all of our days. For you are worthy of it all. We pray this for ourselves and for our brothers and sisters that we would give you the worship of which you are so worthy. And it's in Jesus' name we pray in the power of the Spirit we come and all of God's people said, Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May He lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. May you know it is a hope you're calling of God in Christ Jesus and the surpassing greatness of His power extended to all who believe. Amen and Amen. God bless you tonight in Jesus' name.